Please be seated. <clears throat> For those of you who do not know me, my name is Ernie Vanderkruik, and I, I am an ordained Methodist minister in the Retired Connection. And my wife Polly and I have been attending this congregation for a few years now. And every now and again when uh, Jim is not available uh, and other arrangements can't be made, I'm the second string. <laughs> so I am happy to share with you the words that uh, have been given to me to share with you. And if you will, please pray with me. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For you alone are our God, and you alone are our salvation. Amen. As many of you do know, my way of earning my daily bread these days involves teaching 14-year-olds the mysteries of life, biological and otherwise. And one of the things that I've discovered is a pretty helpful thing to do is every class I begin with what I call a puzzler. It's either a riddle or a problem or something that takes a few minutes but cultivates that critical thinking skill, the problem solving, and is not particularly content related to biology, but nonetheless cultivates a, a way of thinking scientifically. So I'd like to share with you a puzzler this morning. There was a man who bought rice from growers in the United States for $1 a pound. He then took that rice and sold it in India for five, for five cents a pound. And after many years of doing this, he became a millionaire. How is this possible? Bought rice for a dollar a pound, sold it there for a nickel a pound, and eventually became a millionaire. Has nothing to do with exchange rates or the rupee versus dollar thing. This challenges an assumption, and we always have to be careful of our assumptions. The assumption was he was not a millionaire before because he had less money. The answer to the puzzler was he was a billionaire and he was being generous. No. He was a billionaire and slowly he gave away his fortune in the way of rice. The words we heard this morning from the Gospel lesson have been called the Sermon on the Plain. Similar to the Sermon on the Mount that Matthew talks about, but the geography is kind of important here. Luke's pretty definite about the circumstances of these words. Luke tells us that he came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of disciples and a great multitude of people from near and far. And they were a diverse lot. Some were disciples and followers. Some were locals. Some were tourists. Some were believers and some were skeptics. Some were bored and were seeking entertainment and maybe hoping to witness something that they could talk about later. Some came to hear, and even to listen, and many came to see. Some wanted to be seen, while others wished they could blend into the background. Some came to be healed, and some who were troubled to be cured. Some were desperate to find meaning in their very difficult lives. In other words, it was a crowd very much like what we have here today. The crowds that came to Jesus wanted both to see him and to be seen by him. Deep in their hearts, they felt that Jesus would understand what they were going through, that he would empathize with them. 
In other words, they didn't need any more shame. They needed acceptance. They didn't need to have the burden of guilt added to their backs, but rather were seeking the God-given freedom to be the people God created them to be, regardless of what the world dumped on them. They sought to be free of the unnatural behaviors imposed upon them, the inappropriate expectations, the unnecessary strictures and regulations, the tiresome competitions toward perfection and acceptance. Their minds were open to the possibility that Jesus might lead them through his teaching to a new way of living. And finally, they just wanted to be welcomed into the doors of Jesus' ministry. Jesus accepted the people in the crowd. And just as I hope we are willing to accept those that come through these doors, as we have accepted those who have already come through those doors. So we, like them, have gathered here for a variety of reasons, a variety of circumstances, and a spectrum of expectations. And then Jesus looks at us eye to eye, face to face. He sits down like any good Palestinian teacher does, and he looks at their expectant faces, searching his own face. Jesus then pronounces these blessings and woes. And we have to wonder which of those he's directing to us. Are we being blessed by these words? Or are we being warned by these words? Has anyone ever tried to define upstate New York? For people on Long Island and in New York City, upstate is Westchester County. For people in Westchester County, upstate begins in the Mid-Hudson Valley. For the people in Poughkeepsie, upstate begins somewhere around Albany. And for the people in Albany, upstate means the Adirondack Mountains. It's all kind of relative, isn't it? Likewise, how do we define rich? I think most of us would define rich as anybody who has more money than we do. We don't think of ourselves as poor, but we really can't be considered rich, can we? Or can we? How do we describe someone who is full now? Certainly it's not us, because if we had everything we needed, the advertisers and the stores that confront us hundreds of times a day telling us that we are failures until we buy what they're selling wouldn't be bothering us. Now, who among us is laughing? Why are they laughing? They're laughing at us, aren't they? Says that, uh, that adolescent mind that we still carry around with us and all of the wounds that happened in middle school. Who is hated, excluded, reviled and defamed on account of the Son of Man? Who is poor? The homeless? The unemployed? A person of retirement age whose only income is Social Security? And who is hungry? Someone using one of the latest fad diets? or anyone who uses the blessing box or the food pantry. Who are those who weep now? Why are they weeping? Honestly consider your condition in life. Are you relatively well off financially? Are you secure with an abundance of material possessions? Do you get to eat out every now and again and maybe even sometimes at a nice restaurant? Do you have a comfortable home? Do you enjoy life? Are you well thought of in your church, your neighborhood, in your community? Do you have a lot to look forward to? 
And probably the answer to these questions is, yeah, I'm secure, I'm well fed, I'm well thought of, I'm well off with a future of hope and promise. Now consider our community and the world. Those who live near us but we don't know well. Are any of them poor? Are they hungry or grieving or hated or excluded or reviled? Of course we all know people like that and consider them extremely unfortunate. Happy are we, unhappy are they. But Jesus, as he often does, confounds our assumptions and commonly held wisdom. The Lord looked to the kind of people whom we pity, who seem hopeless, and say, blessed are you who are poor, who are hungry, who weep. Blessed are you when people revile you and hate you and exclude you and defame you. The realm of God is upside down. And then even more astonishingly and disturbingly, Jesus looked to another group of people who are more like us, who seem to have it made, and said, Woe to you! Woe to you who are rich, who are laughing. Woe to you when all speak well of you. Woe to the likes of us. For he says that we are subject to great sorrow, to grief and misery. The realm of God is upside down. What Jesus is really saying to us is watch out. For your seeming blessedness is, in truth, a great danger. How can this be? Do we not ask with bewilderment, what in the world is going on here? Doesn't Jesus have it all backward? If the poor, the hungry, the grieving, the hated, the excluded, and the reviled are the happy ones, how are we to understand this? How can we long to be poor? How can we see being hated as a positive value? Does Jesus really mean that hunger and grief will improve our lot? Why would we honor being poor? Don't we, after all, use our wealth to serve God's purposes? Could we not do more for our neighbors if we had more with which to help them? How do we answer these inevitable questions? Well, let's begin by understanding that in these sayings, these blesseds and these woes, Jesus is not glamorizing poverty and suffering. Jesus is not calling us to go slumming or to make ourselves sick or weak. No, there is something much deeper and much more important in his message. Jesus doesn't want us to see disability of one sort or another as a magical cure for what ails us. Surely he knew as well as we know that poverty can lead to despair and suicide, to crime and to violence. But he also knew, as we must learn, that need can lead us to God. Poverty and hunger and despair can provide a beginning for one seeking unity with God. He added the woes probably because he knew that most people like us would have a hard time imagining that being poor could help a person. Jesus focused on the very things that most of us work and hope and pray for. So he listed them as woeful and miserable to get our attention. He knew that being well-fed, happy, and well-thought-of is what we really seek as we smile all the way to the shopping mall or to the bank. 
Above all, he knew that purchasing material possessions and buying insurance and setting aside savings for retirements or rainy days could lead us to imagine ourselves as safe and secure and completely in control of our lives. He knew that people like us stand constantly in danger of assuming consciously or otherwise that we can work our way into happiness or buy our way into joy and peace. It's far too easy for us to believe we are powerful enough or independent enough to provide everything we could ever need. With the kinds of resources and abilities that most of us in this room have, we are in danger of forgetting that we need anything, especially God. And in so forgetting, we fail to let God fully into our hearts and into our lives. What Jesus knew is that most likely way for us to turn to God is when we are in danger and difficulty before it became a figure of speech that has no meaning whatsoever, the phrase, oh my God, was literally a prayer. And at the end of our rope, we can ask, and God will save us. It is so much easier to welcome God into our lives when we know our sin and our spiritual bankruptcy. We will know our absolute need for what Christ can offer and that we cannot produce for ourselves. How blessed, how enviable, how fortunate are those who understand their urgent need for the resources that only God can provide and that they may have simply for the asking. Through these blesseds and woes, Jesus calls us to join the spirit of the poor whom he addressed so long ago. Those have-nots of the first century of whom Jesus spoke had nothing to expect from the world, but they had everything to expect from God. It is through their need that Jesus shows us the way to look toward God to turn to God for help in our lives and in our attitudes and in our values. If we can recognize our need, we can begin to learn where God leads us. We can understand the necessity of seeking God. Our deep sense of helplessness brings us before God just as we are, not as we imagine ourselves to be. We can recognize the power that, of God that can transform us into the joyful, complete, caring, and loving people God calls us to be. The poor can help us get to that glorious day when we will give up on seeking personal resources of privilege or power as the path to true happiness. The poor of Jesus' time turned to God who cared, who healed and uplifted, who above all loved them as they were. Their story can teach us that the love of God is gently close at hand and powerful far beyond those who rule this world. The poor can help us see the need for a power greater than ourselves to heal us and to give us happiness and meaning. They help us to come to the day when we will clearly see the source of this power, Jesus the Christ, our Savior. And on that day, we will join with the saints of all ages as we rejoice and leap for joy. Thanks be to God, who loves us that much. Amen.